Hi, this is Gunnar Peterson, and today we're going to talk about processes, not outcomes, and how improving your process can improve your security architecture. The way we're going to get at that concept is with something called a checklist. Uh, we know that information security has been about risk management for the last 15 years. Risk management is an important tool, but it only takes us so far. There are certain kinds of problems risk management is not particularly suited to solving. Uh, some of those problems are better dealt with tools like checklists. So I think checklists are a strategic asset to any security architecture process. You might ask yourself, can we use checklist and strategy in the same sentence? I believe the answer to that is yes, and this is why. Kent Beck, inventor of extreme programming, said that he used to think of programs as things but now he's come to realize they're really shadows of the communities that build them. That's an important concept. Think about the shadow of your security organization as it relates to software development. What kind of community is that? Are there ways that you might improve it in terms of how they communicate and how people work and collaborate together? The most famous checklist example comes from the B-17 bomber, which crashed on uh, its test flight, uh, killing the crew and the, uh, the flight crashed because the team forgot to engage the airplane's gust lock, uh, one of the many things that needed to be done to fly the plane safely. It was later doomed too much plane for one man to fly, and a number of things were changed inside of the Army Air Corps. What's interesting about this story is not so much what they did, it's also what they did not do, uh, one thing they did not do is they did not require more pilot training. This is a very key concept. The person who was flying the plane, the pilot, uh, Major Peter Hill, was in charge of the Army Air Corps training program. So literally nobody else in the organization knew more about how to fly this plane than he did. So more training would really only get people to that level, uh, which clearly wasn't good enough. And this is, gets at the essence of what a checklist is about. A checklist is not about dealing with things that we don't know. There are lots of problems in security that are about things we don't know. There are also other problems about failing to apply what we do know. And that's what a checklist is about. So instead of creating more pilot training, uh, the Army Air Corps developed a checklist. In fact, they had four things to do before takeoff, things to do in flight, things to do at landing, and things to do after landing. The plane went on to fly 1.8 million miles without another accident. There is a lesson here. Uh, there are also other lessons coming from healthcare. Uh, the intensive care unit is uh, obviously one of the highest risk areas in any healthcare organization. Uh, in this example the, at Johns Hopkins, they were putting in 5 million uh, lines per year into patients in their intensive care unit. 11% of those people were infected after 10 days. So that comes to about 80,000 people for this particular hospital. That meant it was, and this was fatal, 5% of the time. So 5% of those 80,000 people were uh, dying from infections. What did they do about it? They also created a checklist. And both of these examples come from a wonderful book called Checklist Manifesto, which is uh, extremely practical, extremely short, easy read. Um, and the checklist that they put up at Johns Hopkins and has subsequently been used at hospitals all around the world is pretty simple. Wash your hands with soap, clean patient's skin with antiseptic, put sterile drapes over the entire patient. These are very basic things. This is not about dealing with unknowns. This is about reminding people to apply the things that we already know. Uh, we have to deal with ignorance and uncertainty and in information security just like doctors do, but we also have to deal with an unbelievable amount of complexity. There are so many ways to screw up a configuration in information security, and those kinds of things go wrong every single day. There's another subtle lesson here. Um, the checklist is very empowering, and uh, to his credit, Atul Gawande, the author, author of Checklist Manifesto, talks about some examples in his own practice in hospitals where he has been body checked by nurses 
uh, by not for not putting uh, the proper amount of drapes on a patient and that's a there's a lesson there as well right because we've all seen in organizations where you can see what's wrong but you might not be empowered to do anything about it so putting the checklist out there creates an objective measurement that everybody in the organization can sign up for and can work on improving the security in the organization so this has been a, a widely adopted uh, and successful uh, approach used in healthcare and lots of other organizations. What might we learn from it in security? Well, in security, we definitely have complex domains. We definitely have a large class of problems that are about things that we do know that we don't apply. So we can spend a lot of time wondering about the latest and greatest threat that's coming, worrying about zero days. These are all really important problems. But we have lots of other problems that are about things that we do know. And we just fail to apply or we fail to apply them at the right step in the process. There are other reasons why checklists matter to information security. Information security is relatively small compared to the rest of the organization. You can often see a 100 to 1 ratio of developers to information security people. So that means anything we do in security has to scale maybe even as high as 100 to 1. On top of that, security matters everywhere. So we have this weakest link problem where we might do an extremely good job in uh, vulnerability assessment, but our patching or our mediation uh, or maybe our identity access management is weak. And so the result here is that decisions get made that have security implications all across the organization every single day. People are making them right now in your organization. But they're not security experts. And so they don't necessarily understand the trade-offs they're making. So a checklist is helpful to get non-security people to make better decisions and consistent decisions. And also to make them at the right time, specifically earlier in the development process. What are we really asking from a security standpoint out of the organization? Well, we should be humble. We should ask the development teams, the operational teams, how effective is the checklist? Are we hitting the main topics? What else should we include? Where and when is it possible to use it in your process? How should we track the issues and how do we iterate on it? It's not a it's not a one and done kind of thing. It's something that should be part of the organization. It should live. It should be a living document. And so my basic process of doing software security starts with taking a software architecture and building the threat model and figuring out what to build into the system. But at the end of all of that, the objective measurement of the checklist should feed back requirements. Uh, that you can use to improve your process. So a threat model might come and say, we're using SAML, we're using OAuth, and we're using SSL to mitigate some threats, but that should still be judged against the checklist to see if it meets the criteria of the organization. Now, let's look at some bad checklists. I think we've all seen bad checklists, right? So I wanted to quickly go through some worst practices for checklists. Right? So we want to make things that are not bleedingly obvious. Right? We don't want to uh, restate the obvious. We also do not want to confuse people. Right? What does this checklist even mean? Right? What, is this, what are we asking for? It should be very, very clear. We should also lead people in the right direction. We shouldn't just give them something that looks uh, like they, they don't have any idea on how they can execute on it. And again, make things as simple as possible do not insult people's intelligence and understand the use case of what your architecture is living in. So, you know, here's a case where we've got a beware stream sign next to a picnic table that people probably drove 100 miles to go have a picnic next to. Uh, if you're interested about avoiding these worst practices, building your own checklist in your organization, there's a fantastic project called Project Checklist, which is all about how do you develop a checklist? This seems easy. I will tell you it is not easy, uh, but the process is immensely valuable of building a really good checklist. And I'll go through a couple of tips. First is keep it really, really simple. 
You want to tell people what to do, you also want to tell them what not to do. And part, a big part of the whole process is ensuring there is some improved accountability in your system. So to close out on this idea, you want to make sure it's your checklist, not just a generic checklist of what was good for 450 different organizations. What is going to work in your business, your team, your technologies? It's all about improving the interaction between your security team and the rest of the organization. You want to update your checklist. It should not be a static thing. You want to update it when failures happen, when your team changes, when your technology changes. And there are other changes that are important, but it's very important to have a feedback loop into your checklist so it's not a static thing. It should not be the same in 2014 as it is in 2013. Now, a couple of ideas of what might go on a InfoSec checklist. I think carving it out by phase is really important. So I've sort of illustrated one example here of looking at things from an architecture and design standpoint before you start coding, a development standpoint while you're coding, and a deployment step when you're getting ready to promote to production. So early in the process, ensuring you're using improved identity access management systems, assuring that you're following account provisioning processes and you're reviewing that, uh, you're reviewing your policy enforcement points, and hey, why not give a heads up to the vulnerability assessment team so that they know in a couple months you're going to be coming back to them and they can schedule and get their ducks in a row so that they have their penetration test activities scheduled. From, while you're hands-on the keyboard coding, you want to ensure you've got static analysis integration, you're using the patterns around er error handling, audit logging, or your other industry, uh, or your, your other uh, patterns. Uh, if you have banned libraries or, or blacklists, you want to implement checks for those. And then when you get ready to deploy, you want to follow uh, the steps that ensure that your vulnerability assessments complete, your bugs or tracking's up to date, you're integrated to your SIM and your other operational processes. This is just a high-level sketch, but I think the key thing to understand here is first you want to carve it out by time. It should really map to something that uh, looks and feels like a developer or senior architect can deal with. Uh, it maps to their process. It's not another process. It links into the, an existing process. And it really should be simple. There should be very little ambiguity about whether uh, you're checking off this box or not. It creates a lot of accountability. It creates a better process, better, a better way to collaborate across teams. Our current industry trends are very favorable to checklists. Um, in the case of the cloud, you have a lot of outsourced relationships. There's very little ambiguity about who's supposed to do what. Uh, or, or at least there should be, and the checklist can be a tool to get there. In mobile, you have very complex requirements that vary based on the client OS type. What is good enough for iOS is not the same as Android and vice versa. And so having an Android-specific checklist, maybe by uh, version even, having an iOS-specific checklist is also important. So there's no such thing as just a generic client or even a generic mobile client checklist. You want to create one that get, captures the context of what you're really trying to get at and solve for uh, for mobile. So to sum it up, uh, this is not a trust but verify situation anymore. Uh, I'd like to say in God we trust as it says on the, on the $5 bill, but everyone else must use the checklist. Thanks for your time. I'll close with this quote. Everything we think of as a computer today is really just a device that connects to the big computer we are all collectively building. Only thing I had to add to Tim O'Reilly's statement there is let's collectively build security in. Thanks for your time.